This is in a chapter called What About Africa? The figures we are always given for HIV seroprevalence in Africa are based on sample studies taken at a few select prenatal clinics. I cannot reproduce all of them here because the figures are like billowing cloud formations, always very big, very round figures, always estimates, and always capped with a line like, experts say the real figure could be three times that high, which means that the numbers are arbitrarily arrived at in the first place. I once spoke to a UN AIDS official in a casual setting. He was sitting at a bar and we struck up a conversation. Not to insult you, I said, but the figures your organization puts out are pure fiction. Pure fiction, he confirmed, leaning against the bar with his elbow. Why then do you put them out? Money, he said. It's all about fundraising. High figures bring in money. When you get such officials face to face, caught off guard, they tend to tell you the truth in simple language. One more. So wait, 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 wait. Mm -hmm. So A, that brings to mind Veritas, Project Veritas, and it's... Um, mechanism for discovering what's going on by, you know, having somebody go on a date with somebody and yep, yep. Uh, recording it. You know, these people, they're, they're not in the dark about what they're doing. They're just in the dark when they think that they're on the record. And, you know, it's unfortunate that one has to get them off the record in order to uh, discover the reality. I also wanted to point out that consensus science reared its ugly head again this week where Neil deGrasse Tyson was being interviewed by Del Bigtree and doubled down on the idea that it was all about, you know, that science is effectively synonymous with the consensus, which is exactly the opposite of the truth. Everything in science is falsifiable. I used to make this point when we were professors, when I was a professor. I'd ask some question, and I'm not coming up with a good question right now. I'd say, okay, how many people believe X? Knowing that there was, this was a question on which people um, would have an opinion because it sounded right, but it didn't turn out to be true as far as we understand it right now. Mm -hmm. And I get more than half the people in the class to raise their hands. And I'd say, well, luckily for us, science isn't a democracy. Scientific truth isn't established by democratic vote. It's not majority rule. That's not how it works. And I don't understand how um, I was able to make that point over and over and over again to undergraduates, uh, many of whom had, uh, you know, very little background at all in scientific thinking before I met them or you met them, and they got it. And Neil deGrasse Tyson doesn't get it? Well, I mean, I think, it, I don't want to say it's inexcusable, though I think it probably is. Yeah. But the problem is that so few people have intimate contact with actual science as it takes place, right? Even people who have formally gotten degrees in this thing, you have to run an experiment and it has to be properly structured so that the philosophy of science is manifest in the structure of what you did in the lab or in the field. Yeah. And the idea that you can do every single other thing right, right? There can be no way that anybody who walked into your work could detect that you weren't behaving scientifically. And if you just screwed up, you know, the philosophy of science part, if, for example, you collected data not knowing what you were doing, you spotted a pattern in the data, and then you reported that pattern as if you had had the hypothesis going in, right? If that's the only perturbation on normal science, you fucked it up. You didn't do science. You don't have a scientific conclusion. You don't know anything. And so the idea that, that something so concrete as science could be dependent on something so abstract as, well, did the hypothesis precede the data collection or not? You know, or in the weird case that the data was already collected, but if you formulated the hypothesis, insulated from information uh, that's in data in the library, and then you went to the library, that's valid, right? But just because the data pre-existed your hypothesis, if you weren't aware of it, you can still make a prediction. Yeah, it's not post-diction if you are truly insulated from this, mm -hmm. uh, the evidence. But anyway, these are very subtle things on which a process that mostly is quite concrete that involves, you know, beakers or transects or, you know, actual physical things, right? It, the only reason this process works is the underlying philosophy of science, which almost nobody who does the work has studied. Right, and I, I mean, I do, 
I guess my prediction would be that um, those scientists who work at scales that are inherently abstract to humans or with an interface between what they are studying and themselves that is technological and therefore black boxy are more likely to misunderstand this. That uh, being field scientists, as we have been and are, uh, you go out and you are looking and working at exactly the scale that humans interact with. And uh, the yeah, yes, there's plenty of theoretical you know underpinnings, and you're you know hoping to to see something empirical and small that you can then generalize. So you know you're doing hypothetical deduction, doing you're engaging in both induction and deduction. Um, but there is there is stuff that you are observing that is real and interpretable with your own senses at the scales, at the scale that humans can understand it. There is no inherent or at least not always a technological interface, and uh, there is no inherent level of abstraction uh, between you and what you are observing. And that's not to say that there isn't bias, there's always bias, uh, but uh, that does, I think, make it easier to understand why the philosophy of science is so necessary and also just to engage in it with integrity and go like, okay, I can tell when I'm not doing this because all the other all the other frills all the technology all the abstraction of you know doing astronomy or you know doing molecular biology if it's about inferring you know what the uh, what the genes are requires that you have put some faith in the technology is giving me a rendition of the truth well there's also Neil deGrasse Tyson is one of a tiny number of scientists whose job is to interface with the public, right? Yeah, That's but it wasn't all along. I mean, he, right. he's not a science communicator right. by training. He was a, he was an astrophysicist who became Trained primarily a science communicator. And, science communicator, yeah. and there's nothing wrong with that. Right. Um, but what I would point out is every scientist has some small portion of their job that is public facing, right? The mm -hmm. scientist who is working on genomics and then goes to a cocktail party with people who do other things in the world, journalists, mm -hmm. lawyers, doctors, whatever. That person sees themselves as having a role speaking for science, right? They are yep. in the interface between the science trained folks and the non trained folks. And the point is they are presenting in their own minds, you know, a simplified, an intuitive version that allows somebody who doesn't have the training to look into what they do for a living. And the point is, actually, this is a process that gets carried away. You know, mm -hmm. whereas you and I might be the, you know, the skunk at the garden party where somebody is talking about the wonderful things that are going on in university uh, science departments, and we might roll our eyes and say, do you have any idea how crazy these people are? Right? You're not supposed to say that. Mm -hmm. And Neil deGrasse Tyson is the far end of this continuum where his job is actually to promote a sort of beautified version of science. And what would it sound like if a guy like Neil deGrasse Tyson started to become alarmed, you know, let's say 10 years ago about p-hacking and the replication crisis, right? If he got alarmed about that before it became public. Right? People would not know what to make of it if somebody who was supposed to be portraying science as this marvelous process through which we come to understand was actually saying, actually, you know what we're doing? You know, we're lying to ourselves. Like, come on, man, have some gravitas. R right. Get so, serious. You know, yeah. it is his obligation if he understood that such a thing was taking place to do that. But right. I think the problem is this sort of sense of, well, I have a private understanding of how high quality the science in my department is, and then I have an obligation uh, to portray it as better than it is in public. It's the same thing as like when when a school, you know, if you are leading a tour uh, of a college and you are portraying the place to prospective students, your role is actually to advertise the place. Right. Which, 
yep. you shouldn't, right? You actually, your your obligation to the people that you're giving the tour is actually to give an honest assessment of what the place is. Well, but it's, yeah, it's your obligation to your employer or to the people who you're in front of right now. This is the, that tension exists in many, many places, right? That's it. And so yeah. to, to just finish that off, you, you know, a guy like Neil deGrasse Tyson sits down with Del Bigtree and mm -hmm. in his mind, his obligation is to reveal that a guy like Del Bigtree is... It's off the deep the end. Plot, yeah. Right. Uh, and in fact, no, <laughs> it's the other way around. Right. 